But the whole idea of Advent is that um, we look forward to Jesus coming. Now, of course, uh, up until Jesus came the first time, uh, the whole of the Old Testament looked forward to his coming uh, when he was born in Bethlehem. And since then, we've been looking forward to him coming the second time. Even now, we're still looking forward to that moment. But today, I want us to focus on the fact that right back at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis and Exodus, there are so many stories which help us to understand that one day, Jesus would come. So would come out and open up number one, and that just falls down. Who can tell me what that's a picture of then? Yeah. No, maybe Jesus, no? Okay, well, what do you think, Jeff? Well, not yet. Um, what it is, it's the light shining in the darkness. When, when Job just read to us there, did you hear that when Jesus came, the light shone? He was like a light shining in the darkness. But you know, the very first thing that we read in the Bible, right back at the beginning of Genesis, we were told that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and darkness was over the face of the deep. But God said, let there be light, and there was light. The whole nature of God is that he sends light into the darkness. He shows up things that need to be lit up. And he does the same in the human heart. God's always in the business of shining his light in the darkness so that we might know God and so that we might know Jesus. Okay, let's close that one up. Uh, Spencer, would you like to come out and open number two? It's going to go across there, okay? Just gently. That's it. It's going to go across there. Now, what have we got a picture of there? You can tell me. Yeah, Jake, what's that a picture of? Okay, it looks, it's someone kneeling, isn't it? I'm not, not sure they're praying. They're kneeling, and what, what's that foot resting up on there? Andrew, what's that? A snake. Now, you might think that's a strange picture, but yes, it is. It's somebody whose foot is on the head of a snake. And right back in Genesis chapter 3, there's another indication that Jesus would one day come when God said uh, in the Garden of Eden, just as Adam and Eve were going to get cast from his presence, he said he, talking about Jesus, the one who would one day come, the offspring of the woman, he would crush the serpent's head. Who's the serpent? Yeah, Satan, yeah, or the devil. Right at the beginning of the Bible, we're told something else about Jesus, that when he comes, he would crush Satan's head. The Bible says that the work of Jesus is to destroy the work of the evil one. So it's not just the fact that God sends his light. He also gives us a promise about what Jesus would do. He would take away the effects of Satan. And the Bible tells us that when we get to heaven, if we believed in Jesus, that Satan won't be there, sin won't be there, pain and suffering and death. None of those things will be there because of what Jesus has done by crushing the serpent's head. Okay, it's going to go across there. Okay, okay there we go. Who can tell me that's a picture of? What's that person? Spit, what do you think? It's not a dog, no, it could have been a dog, couldn't it? But it's a guy doing something. No, what is it? It is. It's a guy holding a lamb. Who in the Bible, right early on, presented a lamb to somebody? Do you know? Do you know the... I can't remember. No. Okay, well, it's the story of Abel and Cain. When Abel and Cain each offered a, an offering to God, Cain offered vegetables and fruit from his garden. But Abel understood that what God wants when we make an offering to him isn't something that we've made. He wants an offering, a sacrifice. And so Abel sacrificed one of his lambs and presented it to God. He was the first person in the Bible who had the faith to understand that the only way we can come before God is to bring a sin offering. Now, we don't have to bring a sacrificed lamb when we come to God, do we? But we do the same thing when we put our faith in Jesus, because for us, Jesus is the lamb who was sacrificed so that we might approach God. a bit more better known, is it? What's that a picture of? Do you want to remember that story? 
It's Noah's Ark. Yeah, well done. It's Noah's Ark. Jesus said that just as anybody who was in the Ark, who trusted in God and believed in his judgment, anyone who went into the Ark was saved in the same way if we put our faith in Jesus we also will be saved. Jesus is kind of like our ark, isn't he? So that when we stand at judgment, we'll be safe if we believe in Jesus. Oh. There you go. Good. It's a, a ram, yeah. Okay. Where do you remember a story of a ram in the book of Genesis? Right early on. Jay, do you remember it's the story of Abraham, when Abraham had to go and sacrifice his son Isaac. And the Lord said, I want you to come and sacrifice Isaac to me. And Abraham thought, wow, that's my only son. And that's the son through whom you're going to bless me with all these descendants. And so when he went to do that, just as he was about to sacrifice his son, God said, stop, don't do that. Because I never wanted you to do that. I just wanted to see how far you would go if you really trusted me. And as he looked up, the Bible says, behold, he saw a, a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And so he knew that he could sacrifice the ram instead. So the ram became the substitute for his son Isaac. And in the same way, the Bible says that we all deserve death as well because of our sins. But the Bible encourages us that we don't have to kill anything or kill ourselves because Jesus has died the punishment for all of our sins as well. The pyramids, okay, now you're thinking, what's the pyramids got to do with Jesus? But do you remember that the Israelites were exiles in Egypt for hundreds and hundreds of years? They were there in slavery and in bondage, weren't they? And they had to stay there, they didn't really want to stay there. But do you know someone else, very famous, who had to go and stay in Egypt for a while? Who else had to go and stay in Egypt? Well, Abraham, yeah, but someone in the New Testament, yeah, Alex. Not David. Anyone else? Yeah, Luke. It's someone we've been mentioning a lot so far already. Who do you think, Andrew? <coughs> Jesus, yeah, exactly. When he was a baby, <coughs> that's right. When he was a baby, he had to flee to, to Egypt in order to escape Herod, who was killing all the babies. Do you remember that? And the Bible says that just as the Israelites were exiles in Egypt, and just as Jesus was an exile in Egypt, so it is that we're all exiles as well in this world. We're strangers, aren't we? And until we come into heaven, until we come to the promised land, this home isn't really our own home. The book of Hosea says this. It says in chapter 11, Out of Egypt I called my son. So even Egypt is a way of helping us to think about Jesus. Where might we think of another lamb in the book of Exodus? Okay, we're thinking about Egypt now. Yeah, Nathan. Not in the stable so much. Do you remember that before the Israelites left Egypt, they had to do something on their doorposts, didn't they? Do you remember what they had to do? Yeah, Alex. That's right. They had to take the blood of a lamb and daub it or paint it all over the doorposts and then they would be freed from the judgment or the avenging angel or the destroyer that was coming over all the houses. In the same way, we put our faith in blood, but not the blood of a lamb. We put our faith in the blood of Jesus who died for us. See how all these stories help us to think about Jesus. There we go. That's it. The Red Sea being opened up, isn't it? See the mountains here, and then Moses is standing there, and the Red Sea is being opened so that they can go across. You know, the whole idea of the Red Sea opening up was that God was delivering his people from the bondage of slavery. Jesus does the same thing for us. Again, it's another way of helping us to remember what it was that Jesus does. Jesus doesn't deliver us from the bondage of slavery in Egypt but he does deliver us from the bondage of sin, doesn't he? And so it is that when we look at that picture, we're reminded that Jesus does the same thing for us today. Okay, one last picture today. Where's number nine? Who, likes it? Who hasn't done one yet? Actually, have done one yet? Come and do one. It's lit up there. There we go. Okay, there we 
you could be guessing all day as to who this is, because there's lots of people in the Bible, aren't there? But I'm going to tell you who this is. This is a man called Joshua. And he first appears in Exodus chapter 17. Now, he was quite a young man when he first went into the Promised Land. But by the time he leads the people into uh, the Promised Land, he is about 80 years old, okay? Now, there's two things I want you to think about Joshua. The first thing is his name. Does anybody know what Joshua's name means? Do you know? Not sure, no? His name means the Lord saves. Now, there's one other person in the New Testament who has the same meaning to their name. Any idea who that person might be? Jacob. Not Jacob, no. Someone again we've been mentioning a lot already. Andrew. Not John. Thank you. Not Moses, no. Okay, it's Jesus. Okay. <laughs> if you're in doubt, always say Jesus. Most of the time, it's going to be the right answer. Okay, so Jesus' name, like Joshua, means the Lord saves, okay? So it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus has this name that means the Lord saves. The other thing about Joshua is that he was the one, not Moses, who finally led the people into the promised land. The Bible reminds us that if we put our faith in Jesus, if we've trusted in him, if we've asked for our sins to be forgiven, then we're also going to be led into the promised land. What's the promised land for us? What's the promised land for those who believe? Just heaven, yeah. We're going to go to heaven because Jesus is the one who saves us. Do you see how all these stories help us to understand how vital Jesus is? But Jesus isn't just someone who appears in the New Testament. All of these stories in the Old Testament are like a big signpost to say one day Jesus is coming. The most important person who ever lived. He's coming and he's going to do all these things so that we might know God and be with him forever. Let's pray this morning.